We're, We're Batman, Batman at 89. Dearly beloved, we have gathered here today to get through this thing called Bat Minute, a podcast examining Batman minute by minute, and that's a mighty long time. But I'm here to tell you, I'm Niall McGowan, host of Bat Minute, well, used to be Bat Minute 89, but now we're rebranded as just Bat Minute because we've moved beyond the 1989 Batman film, so here we go. I'm one of the hosts, so yeah, that was an awkward intro. <laughs> I am another one of the hosts. I am John Parker. And yeah, that was very awkward, Niall, but I'll, I'll let it slide. Yeah. It, it'll work for okay. me. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, what the, we are joined by returning guests. And this time, oh my God, like, John, what time is it? What time is it? We're in three friggin' continents now because we've got guests in Australia. We've got a guest in LA. And we're in the UK ourselves. Oh my God, we're bringing the world together. With this podcast. We're basically <laughs> time travelers. Pretty much. Exactly. Oh, yeah. <laughs> exactly. That's exactly what we are. And we are healing the world. You know, we, there's a lot of tension in the world at the moment. We're bringing everyone together. Mm. Well, actually, if people follow you two on uh, Twitter as well, they will know that you've got an intense <laughs> rivalry that burns with the intensity of a thousand suns. But you have agreed, both of you, <laughs> yeah. to come on to, to talk about this, to unite for this one movie. So uh, from Australia, we've got a uh, vlogger... And the writer, director, and host, or not host, star of the YouTube series Wolfgang, Dale Kingsmill. Hello, lovely to be here. Thank you for having me. Oh, thank you for coming back. Uh, Hello. And from all the way in LA, we've got another writer and director, but also a spirit stallion of the Simmerman enthusiast, Omar Najal. Uh, <laughs> no! Yes, thank you. No! <laughs> There's actually two. Dale is also, she plays it up, but she loves Spirit, Stallion the Simmerin, the early 2000s DreamWorks masterpiece. I can't <laughs> believe I woke up for this. Uh, I'm taking out my earphones. <laughs> oh, no, we've lost yeah. one. <laughs> I can never remember the name of that film, too. It's always like, you know, it's like Cinnamon Stallion of the Spirits or something. It just won't, it, I'm, the... I'm not going to lie. I have to Google how to spell it every time <laughs> I, I try to tweet about it. I'll be honest. I have not seen it at all. So I only have a vague notion of what you're talking about. It's fine. It's fine. It's, it's an animated horse movie. It's fine. <laughs> You've sold me on that. Animated horse. If you want to see it um, on DVD... Let me know. Blu-ray, let me know. VHS, let me know. If you want to listen to the soundtrack on CD <laughs> or digital, let me know. Do you have know. the soundtrack on vinyl? Now that's what I want. I don't. Well, they haven't released it. I check <laughs> I check probably once a week. This is just like Omar <laughs> dropping birthday hints for like later in the year. Just like, I'm just saying, don't tell him on vinyl. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but actually, what we're actually here to talk about is the first of uh, Prince's theatrical uh, releases the hit film Purple Rain, which spawned the hit album Purple Rain, which spawned the hit single Purple Rain. So it wasn't in the other direction. I just assumed it was in the other direction. No, it's actually this it, that entire out. I think that arguably like Prince's best album was constructed to be a soundtrack for this movie. Which is like what? Yeah, so. I've just been assuming that this was like the eight mile of the eighties. Yeah, yeah. Now, that's the vibe I get. I, I don't care what order they were released in, right? There's no way Prince wrote these songs for this movie. Most of the lyrics are kind of vaguely relevant. nothing relevant. to do with anything. Or, or, or nothing to do with anything, yeah. You're much kinder than I am. It's early. I'm opinionated. <laughs> oh, I should, like, yeah, make note that, like, it's, you know, for... Dale is like 8 a.m., so she's like sitting up with like a nightcap with those with the bauble at the end of it and a little candle recording. <laughs> I do have one of those hats. I could go and put it on if I choose. Oh, and then dude. over, it's like at 3, 3 p.m. in L.A. where uh, we're all on. So you're in the middle of like ducking underneath like a business meeting to, to, to record exactly. this? Exactly, yeah. I've got a second lunch on Melrose. I got to raise that. <laughs> <laughs> I got to make that deal. <laughs> it's Friday night for me and John. We're actually recording this in the bathroom stall at the club. 
because we're out partying because it's Friday. Yep, yep. Nice. So if, uh, if you, I've been hitting those shots. Yeah. So if you hear people like loudly snorting <laughs> cocaine uh, next to us, like that's what that is. But well, it's the eighties. <laughs> well, it's, it, yeah, both in mind and spirit, it is the eighties, if not physically. <laughs> I, I should probably, I mean, people have probably caught on to this, but I should probably point out we are covering this movie because of its vague connection to Batman through Prince. If you're sat that. there going, why are they talking about a Prince movie? This is a Batman podcast. We don't care. We'll do what we yeah. want. I will also <laughs> note as well that the director of this movie, uh, Albert Magnoli, directed... Oh boy, does Albert Magnoli have a lot to answer for. <laughs> but uh, yeah, he, he also directed the videos for Party Man, Bat Dance and yep. Scandalous. So there you go. It's direct. It's directly. I'm going to assume those are Prince songs. Uh, <gasps> yes. You've, uh, you've, you've heard all three of those, Dale. If you if you watched Batman from 1989. Oh, did I? Okay, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, you don't notice 90 percent of those songs in the film. Mm. Oh no, well you notice Party Man because that friggin' takes over the movie for like a good five minute chunk. That, that's like the only one. Oh, is that the really good one? Are you trying to yeah. indicate that there's bad <laughs> okay, ones? <great. laughs> all Prince is good I just Prince. had a favorite, that's all. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, I got a bit aggressive there. That's a, I apologize. That would be <laughs> the best one. No, 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 I'm not going to let that one lie. That would be the best <laughs> one. That was, good one implies the rest are bad ones. <laughs> yeah, best, best. We'll go with that. We'll go. I said the really good one, Omar. The really good one. There was a qualifier at the front. But uh, although, well, might as well get the, you know, put this up top then, because uh, you had, you know, that uh, Albert Magnolia's got a lot to answer for, made it sound as if you don't enjoy this film, Dale. Because like, <laughs> this was a terrible film. I can't believe oh. that you made me watch this. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Can I shock you? I I watched it thinking, oh, this is meant to be a bad movie. And I really enjoyed it. I'll say, well, I know, Omar, you said just... you had saw it when you were a child as well. So you did, you, but you hadn't seen it in so long. You're like, I don't know what I'm going to think. So what did you think post-film? I, and it might be um, just to, while there's like a, a, a lot of uncomfortable content in the film itself, uh, I love it. Yes. <laughs> It is a badly made film. I cannot believe I'm standing alone on this. Also, for the record, I'm just throwing this out there. Omar only finished the movie half an hour before we were recording this. So, just saying. He's making up his opinions on the fly. I've had time to stew on it. All right? Well, we've got two different approaches then. That's that's all you need in life. I, I watched it about four days ago, so we're, we're coming from different angles. I have to say, Dale, like, I was once like you. Like, I was actually... I, I haven't seen this film in about 15 years. So I was like 16 when I watched this. And I remember I stayed up late one Friday night. One Friday night, much like the one we're recording on. And Ooh. I absolutely hated it. And I was, I waited. My brother came in late in the night and he was like off his face because he'd been out drinking all night because it was a Friday. And um, I was just like, I just had to sit him down and tell him how much I hated Purple Rain. And it was all thinking, oh, he's such a, Prince is such an asshole. And it's just all, oh, everything about it is so bad. And I carried that for like 15 years. And then I was like, oh, oh. yeah, this will be a fun one to talk about because it's like this goofy vanity project and it's just all big stupid pop songs and stuff. And then I watched it last week and I was like, oh, sh**, this is like a really good movie. <laughs> it was really like, yeah. <laughs> after all this but time. you're wrong, though. You're Welcome wrong, to the though. Revolution. Prince <laughs> is such an asshole in it. And... <laughs> on top of that, I just, I, in terms of making a movie is bad. It's like we open with a, with a steady state world. There are complications as there are with anyone's steady state world, but it just stays there for the entire movie. <laughs> and then we finish and everything is still the same, except that Prince played a song that his bandmates Tegan and Sarah wrote. <laughs> That's it. That's the only thing that happened. Admittedly, it's the best thing that happened. I do have an issue with, with the way the songs are approached. Um, which I'm sure we can go, uh, you know, more in depth on. But throughout the movie, it kind of portrays Prince as if he's a struggling, failing musician and people aren't enjoying his music. And then he plays the song at the end, which is, it sounds exactly the same as all the other songs. As all the other it. songs. <laughs> yeah. Why is that one different? There, there is a bizarre thing going throughout, like where 
people repeatedly tell him that like, oh no man, nobody's interested in your music but you. Like you're ta- turning audiences away, and every time it shows you like Prince and the Revolution on stage, this is like this is a band on everyone top. Everyone is of- screaming for them because everyone loves yes, them. Yes, and plus yeah. it's also like you're kind of sitting going like these are really good songs. They're performing them excellently. What do these people want if they're not enjoying this? <laughs> and then like Morris Day and the Time come on and so like yeah they're about the same level like what how are they supposed to be infinitely better than Prince and the Revolution yeah. it doesn't make any sense they're, they're Prince light anyway because they're Prince without the, the full pizzazz Morris Day he ain't no Prince I, I will say this I don't hate the movie I don't hate it because I reserve something as passionate as hate for things like Now You See Me <laughs> that I hate this this was just a bad movie. I'm, I'm scared to like. I know this will just launch into a, like a half hour tangent, but like I'm almost afraid. Oh yeah, we can't we can't go into now you okay. see me because that will end talking about yeah, Prince. Now we will not. We, we Bonus. Won't, now we will not hear that. But uh... <laughs> <laughs> Bonus episode on that coming soon. Um, we we could do if you contribute to Patreon. We will do that. But uh, but yeah, I guess we, we should probably just like cause, yeah the film opens with like you're thrown into the setting and it's the you know this nightclub which i think dale you you have an idea what the nightclub's called but i just forgot to make a note of that it's yeah it's it's first avenue and it's because it's on first avenue and seventh something or other so it's a very creative name for a venue first and seventh something or other i think yeah that's it that's exactly i'm looking at the movie right now that's it yeah you got it (laughs) something or other yeah but uh but yeah, then we get the but they're you know Prince and the Revolution are in the midst of playing the hit song "Let's Get Crazy," which uh, a lot of people will probably, probably recognize that as a as a pretty big tune. Uh, was a shock to find out like and the singles released from the album Purple Rain, "Let's Get Crazy" was number was the second single released from it, which is like all right, fair enough. Third single was Purple Rain itself. And I was like, oh, I thought that would have been number one. But the first single to come out from it was uh, When Doves Cry, which is like, that's a bit of a downer to be like, we've got a new album. Listen to this really kind of dark, sad song I've written. <laughs> and then the next one's like, hey, everyone is my friends. I'm back. Hey, it's great. Good times. We're here again. Yeah, you think, he, you think he'd want to come out first, like right out of the gate with a strong like dancey kind of fun like, number. Let's get crazy. Like the song that the friggin' film yeah. at, the, at the film <laughs> opened with when doves cry. You'd be like, oh, this, this has established the mood right, right away here. Jeez. <laughs> I will give the movie this opening up with the, because the first line of the movie is them introducing the revolution. So it just says the revolution. And I thought, ooh, that's a nice reference. The revolution will not be televised, you know, throwing it back oh. to the 70s. Um, but then there was no other playing on it, so it's like, oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I love your, that's a great. <laughs> that's a great analysis. You also get that uh, that guy, <laughs> the recurring announcer throughout the film, the worst nightclub announcer imaginable. Just the worst. It's just like, you know, ladies and gentlemen, the revolution. And the, like later on, it's just like, <laughs> please welcome to the stage. The time. <laughs> it's like, dude, put some pizzazz. He has no charisma. He, he can't he goes, speak. When he goes to like really quiet lounges, that's when he lets it loose, where he's like, everyone give it up for West Montgomery, and just screams, Woo! and then it's just like a nice slow build on the piano. Like, <laughs> it just reminded, I thought like, is this guy yeah, supposed yeah. to be like the brother of uh, the poodle lady in Batman Returns, who's like announcing the penguin attack at the end, who's all like, something else is, something is approaching, very large, very fast. <sighs> foreshadowing. It's the revolution. He was foreshadowing. <laughs> he knew what was coming. <laughs> but yeah. the, amongst that, we could we get a little hit, hints of a uh, characterization because we get, you know, thing is like I, uh, I say like I've changed my mind about this movie, but Dale, you were one hundred percent correct in that Prince is a reprehensible asshole in this film. Uh, and the, the worst. He doesn't get better. Well, to be fair to him though, this this movie tries to tries to explain why, which I right, I was right, but I don't care about why. There's no why. That could ever make up for someone being like an abusive jerk. That's not. A, it's like that the, is true. The, that's that one of true. the worst things in the movie for me is that it it not only forgives Prince's father for being an abusive asshole, but that it goes on to be like, <laughs> and it's okay that Prince is following in his footsteps because he had an abusive father. It's like no, it doesn't <laughs> matter. None of it matters. 
Yeah, you want to you want to see him overcome that and learn and grow. Right? But that Don't hit really people. Happen. I, uh, I just, this is fourth grade stuff. This, this, this is all true facts that you're saying, but I did come around. It's been like, no, I actually like this movie now. <laughs> but, I am such a huge fan of '80s editing. I, I like. I think '80s yes. are definitely my favorite. It is my favorite decade of of films. I just like love how they look, and I love how they're lit, and I love how they sound, and the cuts where they in 80s films are just like eh, it, it, it's just it looks good like they're not worried yes. about like you it's like oh the taxi cab pulls up and then someone gets out and then we cut back to print it's like how does that make sense it's like it whatever it just it's good <laughs> it's just yeah. Yeah. It's a good montage <laughs> it works the thing is like because i do hate prince's character because he like he is like you know despite the fact you're supposed to forgive him in that like oh he's obviously you know it's a man trying to get him out of the abusive cycle of his household and stuff like that but i hate him but then another abusive <laughs> asshole is Morris Day, who... He's yeah. even yeah. worse. They're all terrible. But then He's the uh, instantly, like, could you see him vacuuming his apartment in the montage at the start? <laughs> And he's got, like, a, the hair tied up in a little thing. And he's just like, oh, Morris, is, he's vacuuming his apartment. And then he puts on the zoot suit and then flies out the door to the club. <laughs> it's just like, oh, instantaneously, I saw him. I was like, I can't stay mad at this guy. Look how, like, look at him. <laughs> 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 but you know, again, but he is. Worth it. And the weird thing is, like, okay, we can say that this movie paints Prince in a very bad light because, but at the same time, though, he's not arguably not playing Prince. He's playing the kid. The kid. Oh, the, yeah. The yeah, no, I hate kid. the kid. I just forget that he's that he's called the kid. Yeah, yeah. But the thing is, everyone else in the movie goes by their actual name, and then that kind of makes it like, okay, so Prince. As if he knew, like, well, this character isn't the most sympathetic, so I won't be playing literally myself, but I'll be playing, like, a semi-autobiographical version. Yeah, basically me, but not. Yeah, and I'll give him a different name so people know it's not the same person. Morris Day plays an asshole called Morris Day. (laughs) (laughs) Prince just thinks he's an asshole. And for years, like, I saw this 15 years ago. 15 years I've been thinking, yeah, Morris Day is a dick, because he's just relentlessly horrible (laughs) to everyone around him in this movie. And then it only kind of occurred to me recently, it's like, I think I was, that's just a stage persona. But then why would you want that to be your stage persona? Like, as he, as it's kind of like, oh, I'm like the bad wrestler of 80s pop. Is that what he's yeah, going for? Yeah, he's the heel. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Bring the chair. Time, bring the chair. <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah. I mean, that, that's, that's the role I play on this podcast, so I sympathize. <laughs> John routinely, routinely insults our, uh, our, both the guests and the audience. And then uh, it's a shame it's an audible thing because he's actually standing up on top of some ropes just sort of jeering (laughs) at an imagined crowd that he can't... Yes, yes. Melodrama. That's what what I'm there for. That's what I subscribe for. (laughs) See, this here is a bar of soap. And what you do is you rub it all over your body and that horrible filth that you're all covered with will wash off. (laughs) But anywho... (laughs) I like being evil. (laughs) But uh, I did also find out that uh, apparently uh, Morris Day had a like a really bad drug problem when they were filming this, and he had to literally be dragged to the set on several Ooh, occasions. Really? Which is like when you actually see him in action, it's like, oh, he, he really you wouldn't know because he's like he see he's doing something, but it doesn't look like he's some guy who had to be dragged literally by his heels to yeah. the set. You know, so wow, that is so eighties. <laughs> That's the thing that uh, Jay had to do for Jane uh, and in Clerks. Because he couldn't, he was too nervous to be on camera, so they just had to get him really drunk. Oh, uh, <laughs> that's my approach to podcasting again. Uh, I think actually, because I know, like, it got really bad with with Jason Mewes, because I know, I think it's on the Clerks X DVD. They have like the mm-hmm. old Laserdisc commentary they recorded mm-hmm. in like '97 or thereabouts, and like he's audibly just like lying on the floor of the studio, just kind of shouting up things in like a drunken yeah. haze, and it's very like ooh. Thank God he got himself clean because that didn't sound like that would have been pleasant to be his friend at that point. But. It was seeing Clerks 2 and seeing Jay going through rehab was oddly wonderful because it was like, oh, this is just real life. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know what Clerks is, and I thought it was a TV series until you oh my said God. Clerks 2. <laughs> oh, Now, I have only seen the second one, so I'm kind of in the middle what? of the <laughs> And I didn't like it. <laughs> well, it's it helps to see the first one. I, <laughs> probably, probably. But uh, the, the, well, the second one's debatable enough. But like, 
just as a film by itself, but like without the first one, it's just like, oh, you're gonna be completely lost. But like, <laughs> it was just it was just crude jokes. I I don't like that. I don't. I'm a classy guy, mm. you know. But uh, <laughs> anywho, <laughs> let's get back to a. I film. stand with John. <laughs> yeah. Now Morris Day is a classy guy. Mm. Well, <laughs> actually. He, no. <laughs> All those drugs. Uh, well, even just, or his treatment of anyone. Uh, <laughs> apparently, he's, he's a horrible, horrible man. But, uh, or at least his character, the character of Morris Day is a horrible, horrible man. Can I point out something about this club, right? Because in the first sort of, it's quite a big span of time. The first sort of 15 minutes of this movie, it, it keeps portraying this club as being kind of rough. Yeah. Right. Have you have you looked at the club? <laughs> it's not rough. Like no rough kind of part of town looks like this. Mm. I've been to some rough places, and the, this is a fancy club. This is big. Yeah, it's not rough. It's just full of glam punks. Yeah, <laughs> I thought maybe back in '84, this was like, oh no, you don't want to go to that place, man. Like all the the frilly cravats they're wearing. Oh <laughs> my god, they got sunglasses Except. with with edges so sharp they'll take your eye out. <laughs> I, that, that's my. That, if I time traveled, when I tr- when I when I do travel, because um, my folks are British, so anytime like we would go uh, to oh. the UK, it was a thing where it would just be like um, anyone who was like trying to be intimidating, I couldn't take seriously because it wasn't from my culture. Mm-hmm. And even when I go to like other states in the United States of America, I'm just like I, I just don't buy it. Like if I'm in New York, they're like, "You better watch out." I'm like, "It's New York. It's not San Francisco. I don't care." Like they can't <laughs> good try to mug me. And then uh, I imagine Please don't if say I... try to mug me to thugs in New York. Oh, I did, and they couldn't do anything because <laughs> because um, fourth biggest economy in the United States of America in 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 the world is California. Uh, we have Silicon Valley. I mean, I was just throwing facts at them. They were they were running. Uh, <laughs> Intimidated. <laughs> so they were so intimidated. I know if I went to the eighties, I would have that. I mean, I was I was alive in the eighties, but if I was like actively walking around the eighties in time travel, and it was like a uh, crocodile Dundee situation where someone like tried to intimidate me, I would just laugh because I'd be what like, "What is look, happening? What is this like... description? What is this setup?" <laughs> so I'm walking through a city in 1985, let's say, yep. and this shirt, this guy who's mostly shirtless but is wearing like a leather jacket. And yep. he has like two like stuff. I think it was punk, crocodile skin, but yep. <laughs> uh, people on the side, and then they go, "Give us your wallet," and they have like these giant glasses. I would just, I, I would laugh. Like I just, I wouldn't be able <laughs> to deal with that situation, and I wouldn't be intimidated in any. Well, regard. right, but you're also you're also a time traveler in this scenario, and I, in I, as far as my understanding of time travel, time should try to protect the time traveler at all costs. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, it's the what responsibility that... of the the fabric of time to protect the time traveler. Well, that's Ooh. in order to protect itself. Like it will, like it it will fade you Marty McFly style if it needs to. But anyway, look, let's not get into Dale's <laughs> theory of cookie time. Yeah, because I, I, I thought you're like, oh, it was like protecting people, as in like. Oh, this guy's showing up in a police box and he's wearing Converse and like a suit, but it's like medieval <laughs> times and nobody's batting an eye. But it's like, oh, time is time itself is like, well, no, it's okay. He he can get away. Like with I it. would look like the shirtless guy with the leather jacket. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's a here's a weird thing about this movie, and in fact, it it's going to be something we notice in the future with other Prince movies, I imagine. He's walking around dressed like this. Yeah, right? I love how he looks. Movies. Don't get me wrong. I wear weird clothes. But nobody confronts him on it. Like it, it's just seen as normal by everyone in the film. Mm. That, yeah, that I he love looks that. like a French dandy. Yeah, <laughs> like, what? yeah. Like the cops are talking to him at the end, and yeah, he's, casually. <laughs> yeah, and he's dressed like a pirate, and they're like, "This is fine. <laughs> yeah. This is this is normal. This is ordinary everyday stuff." You think someone would be bullying him, and that'd be part of the story? Because when nope. I dress, like... no, you wouldn't. Because there is no story, Niall. <laughs> hey, it's John. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, John was talking, but you're the one who said the movie was good. Oh, he's, what are you talking about? Well, he said I, he I liked it too. too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> though there is a, a to that to that end, though. Yeah, there is a because I, mean, I could stand it. Like, well, I say stand. I could take that in the club, where it's like, oh well, yeah, the, the, a bunch of people are dressed up very flamboyantly. It's a club, but then you see, you know, once we get out, let's go crazy. And there's a little bit where uh, you know you meet the time and whatnot come out and perform jungle love and all this sort of stuff but then we get prince getting on his 
purple motorbike, guitar slung on his back, and he speeds through a crowd at one point. It was like, he's going to bang someone in the head with that thing. That's insanely dangerous. That's the thing to get you written up for right there. But then he goes back to his parents' house. It's also like, he can afford that motorbike. He can afford that outfit. He can afford to get his hair done like that. He can afford all the clothes he wears. Why is he still living with his parents? The guy clearly has a fortune. Just to be like, yeah, but it portrays him as poor, yeah. doesn't it? He's clearly like portrayed as a poor character, as a poor guy. Mm. But look, because later on we see like he's, he really uh, wants this guitar. And he's like, oh, he's just standing gazing at it. Wayne Campbell style, standing gazing at this guitar in the window. And it's like, he <laughs> looks like he could afford anything. Like, what? Like, what? Just don't buy product for your hair for like a week, and there you go, you can afford the guitar. <laughs> I think what I love so much about this movie is that it takes place in a Prince verse. Yes. In the same way that, like, when you're in a Marvel film, you're not like, hold on, hold on, hold on. He can swing on buildings like no one like stops and goes like we have to stop all this logic and i love the prince verse because you have to figure out the rules for the first hour of the movie <laughs> like you're really not quite sure you're like i think prince? that's generous i think it takes the full two hours of the movie and that you still don't understand afterwards <laughs> oh that's so good it's like a mulholland drive sort of oh. situation i like, actually thought while watching because i rewatched mulholland drive recently and one of that my is favorite trip- movies that's a weird choice. I'm not going to lie. That's a weird choice for favorite movie. It's an interesting <laughs> film, but it's a weird choice for one of your favorites. It, but, it's in my top five, definitely. No. But uh, it's such a trip. And then watching this Prince film, I actually thought to myself, this is, this is very David Lynch. Actually, I've got, I've oh, got a... Now I really want him to be in Twin Peaks. I've, I've got a legitimate... <laughs> Uh, Lynch connection actually in this in the scene we're talking about. Whoa, oh, it's all connected because uh, the guy Prince's father, Clarence Williams the uh, third. Mm-hmm. Most people will be like, oh, the villainous character of Prince's dad also played the even more villainous character of the FBI agent who suspends Cooper from the FBI in, Tw- in Twin Peaks no. season two. Oh crap! That's yeah. that guy. Yeah. Oh my god! The whole time I was watching this, I kept saying, I know him. I know him. I know him. <laughs> That's amazing. So I was like, yeah, I mean, I look, the rest of his career is a real one episode wonder guy. He's in about a million things, but it's all one episode, one episode, one episode. Not- well, when you kick out Coop, what do you expect is going to happen? <laughs> people are like, <laughs> yep. we found out Screw what you, you did. Man. Get the- that, is a, that is a bit of viewing advice. If people, uh, actually, I, I feel like I've spoiled something now. If you've not seen Twin Peaks, yes, there is a bit where Cooper gets suspended from the FBI. <laughs> but once you watch season three, that doesn't matter. Like, that's not, that's the further thing <laughs> from your right mind. back. But, like, their uh, handy bit of viewing advice, as soon as Cooper gets suspended from the FBI, stop watching for, like, nine episodes. And then no, yeah, when it gets no, reinstated... I'll defend those episodes, man. No, no, no. <laughs> once he gets reinstated, once David Lynch's character literally shows up to reinstate Cooper in the FBI, that's when the show gets good again. <laughs> it's like, oh, there you go. That's So there's a gap where he's going around in, like, a checkered shirt, and he's not got the black suit, and it's like, <laughs> this isn't... This isn't right. What the hell's happened here? You're just like, hey, guys, just here for the pie. Yeah. I'm really just here for the pie and the coffee. This is like, oh, God, doing something, some dead dog farm or something. I'll get to it eventually. <laughs> it's like, what is going on? I like that for a gap of nine episodes, your advice isn't to just hold in there because it'll get better again after <laughs> nine episodes. It's don't even watch him. I know. No, yes. No. I think you him. could, I think you, well, maybe whatever episode Annie gets introduced in. Because she's great, so I really love that character. But then as soon as she gets introduced, there I pick it up there. I think that's around maybe like seven episodes after he gets suspended. So as soon as you see her show up, that's when it's... As soon as you look in the credits and you see Heather Graham's name written down, that's when you just start watching it again. But everything else is... You don't need to see that. You don't need to... Like, I love Civil War buff Ben Horn, but, like, you don't need to see (laughs) it. Like, it's just... It's not integral to the plot. Well, I'll tell you what's uh, an intriguing part of this plot... Like, Apollonia turns up, the love interest of the film. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. And she, first off, she's she's staring at Prince. Like, uh, sorry, the kid. <laughs> and she's, like, really into him. As soon as Morris Day comes out, she she changes. She's really into him. I don't, maybe she just really on... likes music, live music. Maybe, maybe, because she's... She's a very strange character in a movie full of strange characters. Like, I don't... You know what I think the strangest thing about her introduction is? She she sneaks into the club. She she sort of runs past as the bouncer is busy stopping people from fighting. Gets her foot um, hurt. 
Yes. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, she bumps into the waitress, who is the best character in the film, let's be honest. Oh, yeah, the, um, I've got it noted down as Blonde Aubrey Plaza for some reason. I don't know why. <laughs> oh, yeah. Because <laughs> she had no tonal changes in her voice, I, I'm guessing. I think um, it might have been just the, the, the eyes as well. It's like, oh, that's a total Aubrey Plaza look she's given us there. Yeah. I'll be honest, it wasn't the grandest performance, but she was the best character. Um, and so Apollodia bumps into her, makes her drop the tray of glasses, and they smash everywhere. And she sort of says, what are you, stupid? And then immediately Apollonia is like, oh, hey, can you get me in good with the manager of this club? And I'm like, wow, <laughs> that is some goal. That is That's how some you guts. Do it. That's how you do it back in the 80s. Yeah, yeah, no podcasts to get people on to no. spread the word. You, know? you knock over a tray, you make a name for yourself. <laughs> and then she, yeah. she doesn't seem nearly grateful enough to the best character in the film after that. I don't know the waitress's name, so I'm just going to call her the best character in the film from now on. <laughs> that's fair, that's fair <laughs> enough. Um, but yeah, there is, like, uh, actually, uh, even uh, Apollonia, because I think, again, thought, like, well, maybe Dale will know something. Because Apollonia, does that have, like, that's a, like a Greek name? Has it got yeah, any... that's, that's the feminine, it's the feminine form of uh, Apollo, yeah. Oh, is, is there any, like, myth- mythological characters who have any significance that could be, like, equated with this film? Or is it just like, no, she's just got, like... A... Uh, no, I think they just, I mean, I suppose Apollo was the god of music and dance. Oh, um, I think it's so huge. that... that... <laughs> <laughs> Seems like a huge okay, connection. Okay, no, you say that's a yeah. huge connection. But here's the thing. If you use symbolism, you got to go somewhere with it, Omar. You can't just be like, there you go, Apollo reference. Oh, no, she plays music later in the film. It happens later no, in the movie. Mm. Right, I know that she. the whole movie is music, Omar. There is no movie. <laughs> There's only a bunch of songs on a stage. Let's be honest. That doesn't make it enough of a symbolic reason yeah. to name her. Apollonia. Well, like you could name any of the characters after Apollo, and know. it would change nothing. To be to be fair, Best though, character. her actual name in real life is Apollonia, <laughs> so that's a. So I think <laughs> what? Because yeah, 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 yeah. It's uh, Apollonia Cotero. Uh, she was no, yeah, yeah, totally. Apparently, uh, originally in the part, um, it was. Does this movie just have an aversion to naming characters? <laughs> well, that's except for Prince. <laughs> No, but that's... He doesn't even have a name. He's just the kid. That's not even... <laughs> like, yeah, apparently, uh, originally it was supposed to be uh, the, the Vanity from uh, Prince's side project. Vanity 6 mm. was supposed to play the part. Uh, and then she had, a, like, created disputes with the Prince and left Va- Vanity 6. Uh, a lot of people remember the song uh, Nasty Girl, which played in the film Beverly Hills Cop, yep. which star- which mm. co-starred Stephen Burkoff, who we might see again in Prince's next movie. So mm. things, things are all coming together. <laughs> and then apparently the part was offered to Jennifer Beals from Flashdance, who uh, turned it down. And she also memorably turned down the role of Agent Scully in The X-Files at a, at a later date. Oh, wow. really? Yeah, a... She walks her own path. <laughs> uh, but then apparently Prince... Ca- oh, I'm reading from the IMDb here. Prince cast Apollonia Cotero, a virtual unknown at the time, after he saw her in Tales of the Gold Monkey, Force of Habit. She played a saucy <laughs> island girl who was sleeping with a German priest. So, oh, boy. That's, that, was, that was enough to land her this part. <laughs> I'll be honest, right, the whole, the casting of this, like with the whole band, I I hesitate to call them a band, but you know, (laughs) Apollonia's group that we see later, I get the impression that all cast just because Prince went, these, uh, these girls are hot. Oh yeah. Like, oh. There's nothing else to it than that. Prince just wants yeah, everything them. that Morris did in the movie in order to cast those girls in the band. That's how Prince cast the movie. Yeah. A hundred percent. Of course, I think like cause Apollonia 6, well, that was the, I think when Vanity left Vanity 6, they became Apollonia 6, and then Prince just like, oh, I'll, just, I'll do whatever with them. Um, <laughs> fans of The Godfather, of course, will remember the hit singles from Apollonia 6. Uh, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Wednesday. And uh, <laughs> Apollonia! <laughs> Apollonia, no! And that's, uh, that was my Godfather uh, reference. Uh, I just had to that's good. Yeah. That's good. Although the thing is, because I, I just had to fill it in, because it's like, I'll, like how many... I'd, Al Pacino is in no Batman film, so it's like I'm never going to get to do an Al Pacino impression. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I was yeah. Thinking, what a missed opportunity. Because the whole thing, that was like, I started thinking, like, oh, who would he play in Batman anyway? It's like, well, obviously. Calendar Man. I would say, obviously, oh, like, <laughs> you'd play, like, the ventriloquist, because then you'd have the dummy of Scarface. <gasps> and you could get, oh like, my God. you could totally get him doing, like, the 1970s Al Pacino. Yes, I'm Al Pacino, and I'm just, like, I'm a, a timid little man voice. 
And then when he does the dummy, he'll be like, yeah, I'm Scarface. Oh, yeah. Ooh, ah. I'd be like, oh, that'd be amazing. That would be so... <laughs> That'd be so good if, oh gosh, sorry. I, I Well, no, this is a Batman podcast. I just feel like the, Batman became so action-oriented. We, like, dropped so much great 80s and 90s Batman stuff, like, all the <laughs> yeah. time, where it's just, like, he has to fight, like, I don't know. They're, they're, like, the next one they'll do is they'll just, like, let's see Batman and Killer Croc, like, fight each other because, like, we introduced in Suicide Squad. But I would so much rather have, like, a Scarface episode or, like, a really sad, like, just do Clayface. Mm. Just do the Clayface episode. Just make me cry. Yeah. I'm going to give you 12 bucks. Just make me cry. <laughs> I got to say, I think it was, like, the second Clayface Bobby. episode scared the crap out of me when I was a kid because there's a bit where he he shoves Batman into his chest and then he just he yeah let him out and you see Batman struggling to get out and I remember as a kid been like literally terrified and then that's the little girl one right uh yeah on the- is it where it's like a little girl and they like the little girl's like I'm scared and then you find out it's because like she's actually part of Clayface oh and she yeah became, like sentient yeah. Th- and then she was like, I don't want to go. And then she like dies because she becomes Clayface again. I th- I think I'm, I'm, I've never seen what you're talking about, and it's terrifying. I think I, I never thought about Clayface as this scary before. Oh, it's it's, it's in there. <laughs> oh, I don't think it is that episode. I think it's I, I remember it specifically because it's the episode. The episode is great, but it doesn't make sense because Clayface's <laughs> whole thing is that he's found a way to make himself human again. And he has to steal yeah. to do it. And then at the end, he's about to make himself human, and Batman trashes the machine to stop his scheme. <gasps> and then it's like, right. and you're kind of like, Batman, yeah, arrest him. Wait until he's turned human again. <laughs> You've just yeah. condemned him to this oh life of being Clayface. No wonder he hates you now. <laughs> it's like, yeah. This is why I hate Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> but we're not here to talk about you hating Bruce. We're here to talk about you hating Prince. <laughs> and everyone else apparently well, actually, in the film. <laughs> Niall, did you bring up the and puppet? And now you see me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> did you bring up the puppet, Niall? Because in this movie, if you haven't seen it, everyone, Prince occasionally talks through a puppet. Yes. Yeah, a little in, a, in a cone? Yeah. Like, what? what's going on? I, all I could think I of was Arrested Development and Franklin. Oh, man. <laughs> oh, no. You'd think, I, actually, no, the, the film goes out a couple of points now because they didn't have Franklin in as, the, as that puppet. <laughs> like, they wouldn't have known, but it's like, oh, you should have seen through space and time to know that that should have been the puppet. <laughs> the put- but, this, yeah, because he does, yeah, when he's telling off, uh, well, there's a whole recurring plot point where Wendy and Lisa, who play, you know, Wendy and Lisa. In oh, the, Tegan and Sarah, yeah, right? yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, they come to. They're not, but go on. They, <laughs> they're constantly kind of badgering Prince. To, well, I say constantly. They're very kind of politely going like, "Oh, you should be." Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. I, th- I would say, argue they're actually the best characters in the movie because it's like, oh, they're just trying yeah. to, you know. But um, the best characters in this movie are the waitress, Tegan and Sarah, and that one skeleton-faced guy smoking <laughs> in the crowd at the end. <laughs> And all yes. of those characters, I know this is skipping to the end a little bit, but all those characters get beautiful closure. Mm. Oh, yeah. Beautiful closure. Oh. And those they all are, are getting a spin off so movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, they, 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 they apparently have written a song. I was like, oh, I wonder if we'll hear the song later on in the movie. But uh, yeah, they have a recurring thing where they're trying to get Prince to, to like, listen to, just, or just to consider performing their song. And it, yeah, through a puppet, he goes, he keeps going like, oh, why would he do that? And it's almost as if, like, was Prince just wanting to show off that, like, by the way, also pretty good at ventriloquism as well. Just, <laughs> yes. just, he just learned how to do it, I think, basically. But the thing is, once everyone kind of goes like, oh, this, this guy, and kind of walks away, there's a bit where he's sitting with the puppet himself. And he's going like, well, why would you want all that? And it, like, the puppet slowly turns to him, and he looks at it, and it's like, is this going to turn into, like, a horror movie now? Because it's kind of got, like... <laughs> yeah, I was terrified! This is, it's vaguely got a bit of, like, Danny in The Shining with, like, the little finger, like, Tony. Mm. And I go, like, why wouldn't you... You pre- know what you gotta do, kid. <laughs> it's like, what? It's like, well, why don't you want me to perform their song, uh, Tony? Just like, I just don't... And there's just, like, flashes of, like, the stage flooding with blood or something. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, man. Now that would make it even better. <laughs> But uh, that, that that scene has also uh, established the firm fact that Prince is a dick to his his own band uh, as well. So yeah, why yeah. anyone mm-hmm. hangs about? I guess the whole thing is it's like, well, he's really talented. But still, like, why would you be? Except that the whole thing is that he's really talented. 
But then we keep being told that no one cares about yeah. his talent. So which one is it, movie? <laughs> I don't understand what we're supposed to feel for him. Like, are we supposed to be rooting for him to, like, you know, become a breakthrough star? Are, are we supposed to hate him? Are we sympathizing with his, his upbringing? Like, what what is the emotion? Yeah, I have no idea. And and then even, like, <laughs> when he, he start, you know, initiates his relationship with Apollonia uh, by stealing her over-the-boot over the ankle bracelet, which I thought was quite an odd <laughs> way to go about things. <laughs> I'd never understand, like, this is, everything he's doing is horrible. Like, I'm, the, I'm no is Casanova, that? but I'm pretty sure, like, this isn't the way you're supposed to treat not only a prospective, like, love interest, but just anybody. Because, of course, then... No, that's how I, you know, that's how I do it. I steal jewelry. Uh, that, yeah. That's Theft the key. Theft is the way to a woman's heart. <laughs> of course. But the, of course, the, 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 he takes her out in a ride. And I will say, actually, my favorite Prince song, Take Me With You, plays as he takes her out. Mm-hmm. To, uh, mm-hmm. oh. to Lake Minnetonka, uh, and then we do have a. Uh, oh no! Wait, so they it's think it's not Lake. Oh, yeah. oh, that's the twist. That's the twist of it. But uh, we never find out where Lake Minnetonka is. Yeah. Is it real? I have a feeling. Yeah, it's he's made it up just so he can do that bit. Like that's the whole thing of just like there is there is no Lake Minnetonka. That'll be like the fifth year into their marriage. <laughs> Like they'll be lying in bed and shit. The shoot. lake burned down 15 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> See, now that makes a bit more sense, but just, just to bring it back to this is a badly made movie, like it's not good at storytelling, why wouldn't you then have the line be, there is no Lake Minnetonka, rather than that's not Lake Minnetonka? Oh, because the impressionism <laughs> of it. That's what I love so much about the it. The impressionism just... of it. Yeah. Where well, you're like, right. you never... You never get like the A to B to C. It's just like there's A, and then it's just like, but it's not A. And then so Lake it's more Minnetonka like a vacuum. Lake Minnetonka is real. It's in Minnesota. Oh. Yeah, I don't need to get cut to. I don't need cut to Minnesota and then have like a little like Fargo scroll up of what like. What I'm saying, Here's Omar, lake. is that the whole thing didn't make sense. <laughs> <laughs> in a beautiful way, surely. Yeah, exactly. You go from B to G. <laughs> here's here's the thing. I'm gonna say this movie is, and I, this uh, I don't know how if everyone here has seen it, but um, this movie for me is the opposite of Solo, where Solo had mm. a lot of plot points that were supposed to tell a story, but I didn't go on any emotional journey. And this movie has no plot points, and I go on such an emotional journey. <laughs> like that's, that's yeah. ridiculous. There's <laughs> no opposite. journey in any direction of any kind. I mean, sure, you're allowed to have your own opinion or whatever, I guess, Omar, but... <laughs> oh, Well, this, this scene, though, is possibly... <laughs> I, I, I possibly is most oh, we're Lake dickish. Minnetonka, that's what I, I, can, can I keep track of what scene we're on? We're going all over the place. Lake Minnetonka, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, all over the place is fine, but the, the lake, the, let's call it the Lake Minnetonka scene. <laughs> this is possibly when he's acting the worst <laughs> in this whole movie. If you can say that, well, other than when he hits her, but we'll get to mm. that. <laughs> oh, you mean acting is like, in like his... That's a pretty his, big caveat. <laughs> you mean acting is in like what he's doing as a character rather than like this prince's... Yeah, not his actual his actual performance. I think okay. he's okay oh, as an right, actor right, in this Right, right, right. Okay, I'm with it now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the way the character is acting. Mm. Because he's just completely messing her around. Yeah. Like in every conceivable way. And not in a charming, like a little jokey kind of way. That's what he wants to come across like, but... No, he just comes across like an arsehole that you'd slap. Mm. Because he does... Yeah, I could almost think that it wasn't... Like, if, if, if they had known each other a little bit longer, like more than a day, mm. and she wasn't dressed head to toe in leather at the time, <laughs> then I would think, oh, maybe that's like, oh, funny, cheeky, whatever. Like, maybe yeah. I could sit there. But the fact that she's going to have to put her leather clothes on again <laughs> after getting soaked is... That's too far. And not only that, he pretends to drive away and leave mm. her. <laughs> That's a thing. Like I've had, like I have a friend who does that a lot. Like when he offers you a lift and you go up the, mm. and he drives, and he always thinks it's hilarious. And like I, I do kind of slightly, like I love him, but I do kind of hate him. And it all dates back to just <laughs> that. Like, just him thinking that that's funny. Because no one ever appreciates it. No one's ever got on or into the car or on the bike going, that was really funny. It's always just like, that was so annoying. Why did you do that? Like, why? <laughs> what purpose, what greater good did that serve? And then even when she's on the bike, all he says to her is like, don't get my seat wet. I was like, you asshole. What the hell's the matter with you? <laughs> <Yeah>. What a jerk. <laughs> oh, my God, this guy. 
We're only we're not even that far into the movie, and I hate him. <laughs> and we didn't even mention at the club before. Yeah, all sorry. he does is really like just lecherously stare at her and almost lick his lips. <laughs> it's vile. There's like a thing about Prince. Like my mom's a huge Prince fan, and there's like a thing like the like Prince fanaticism. It's so interesting. Like if the second mm. you're out of it, you're like, this is scary. Like this is like murder. <laughs> but like. <laughs> Like in Prince fanaticism, that's like the style, mm. and it makes me like wonder, like, what am I doing? Like, does my X Men love make me blind to where I'm just like, the X Men are great, and they're like, you mean the man with knives in his hands stabbing <laughs> people? That's great. And I'm just like, yeah, he's a hero. Mm. He's oh. he makes so many sacrifices for our country. <laughs> like, I really have to wonder, like, wh- what are my blind spots? Uh, oh no, you can't knock Prince. I mean, he's he's just so ridiculously. Prince. Sensual. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's like you you can forgive ninety percent of, of what he does in the movie because you're like, eh, it's Prince. Mm. <laughs> mm. Like, I, I, I will just make one addendum. You can forgive. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say like again, for fifteen years I did have a like no the, the, this, this at least the kid. He's just absolutely morally reprehensible. But one character again and who does something even worse. Oh well or his friend does anyway, is uh Morris Day, when you see him out uh, strutting his stuff, and then uh, mm-hmm. you know he's trying to get, he's decided he's gonna fa- f- like found like a girl band basically uh, with Apollonia. He's got his sights set on her, which is immediately quite pervy as well. Mm-hmm. There's a, a scene where he's walking down uh, you know, the, the street with uh, his friend and you know uh, Jerome. Jerome and big uh, people who come in for the onto the Cherry Moon episode. You might see a hell of a lot more of Jerome in that movie. <laughs> uh, shockingly, um, but uh, yeah, and I will say because of just the sheer comical, every, everything about Morris Day is funny to me because he looks like he's about twelve years old. Like he's supposed to be like yep. this suave, cool guy in this zoot suit, but he looks—he's like Vincent Adultman and BoJack Horseman. Like he's just—I'm—I'm I'm kind of slightly convinced it's, it's two kids in a suit, like and, yes. and they put on a glue-on mustache. And this is him. It's like this is how adults act. I swagger around, and I call women names, and I say I've got a little, a couple, I got a couple of sexies on standby, and all this kind of stuff. And it's like that's abhorrent, man. But like that is toxic masculinity, I guess, isn't it? Mm, but Where it's just absolutely. a little boy in a big suit. <laughs> like, and like, the weird thing about it, it works even better than I thought. Yeah. What the, the weird that? thing about Morris Day and Jerome as well is that yeah, toxic masculinity. But then they're both, they act very effeminate. They've got this very sort of like campy kind of nature about them. And it's like, oh, that's a kind of a weird, because they're not very butch and manly. I suppose they'd have to on some level in order to really be believable as rivals of Prince. Mm, yes. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, that's, that's true enough. Because Pr- Prince is the, the quintessential like guy for that. I mean, he... He's very insanely, crazily effeminate. Mm-hmm. Yet he's he just oozes sexuality and like he's the most sort of um, sensual man. <laughs> you know, it's uh, well, it's very attractive to people. It's a very strange combination. It, it, it's mm. great. Oh, I will say that because I know I've, I've you know been doing a bit of a bit of research for this. Uh, I did look into Wendy and Lisa, and like uh, they're actually. Uh, I think at the time they were like a gay couple. They were like a lesbian couple, and then they went out. They were dating for twenty years, and they're still. I knew it. And they've got a. <laughs> <laughs> you could tell. But are you? Wait, hold on. What? Wait, hold on. Really quick, can we pause? What did you know, Dale? That they were totally dating. Okay. <laughs> I was just you, could, you could sense it, could you? You could feel it. They just like in that scene where they're jamming together because Prince didn't show up to rehearsal. I was like. You too. Mm. <laughs> There's tension here. <laughs> like, I could tell just because, like, I was actually quite attracted to them, and I've got a, a insane track record of, like, any... Mm. M- most women I go, like, oh, I really like them. They're really cute. Almo- almost <laughs> definitely will be like, yeah, she's she's gay. <laughs> it's like, all right. I've got a type. <laughs> Every time. <laughs> I've got a type, and it reached a pinnacle where at one point I was constantly flirting with a girl who was, I kept seeing in the street. I say flirting. I was trying to, like, you know, instigate something. And then I later found out that she was the lesbian sister of a girl I had already slept with. And I was like, holy <laughs> crap, I've, I don't think I've ever, I'm like, that's just like, 
I was just like, oh, I should just stop. I should just shut myself down altogether. Just retire. Yeah, just like, that's it. Oh, my gosh. You're living episodes of Coupling. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, that's wonderful. <laughs> this should be a podcast, man. Come on. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, but, you know, again, uh, we got... Uh, although, uh, that was a point I was going to make, though, because the fact that Wendy and Lisa, um, they're, you know, a lesbian couple, but they've said, like, in interviews, it's like, oh, yeah, Prince is, like, incredibly effeminate and... Like so much of him mm-hmm. seems like he would be like a gay man, but apparently they're like, oh no, but he's not mm-hmm. though. Like he's very, very intensely sexual in the other way. And I know there's rumors in the late in the nineties during one of his big like religious phases that he actually went very homophobic for a while and then recanted later on. But that's one of those sort of like ah, oh, it's some people say and some people don't. But um, mm-hmm. I will I will note though as well that it's quite um, it is notable that like this movie. Probably about like a ninety-five percent uh, cast of people of color, and then the only two prominent white characters are uh, are lesbians. And it's like, oh, that's you. There, there's no real cis white mm. males as you as just like all films of the eighties. It was all cis white males, but this is like, no, that's yeah. true. Gotta, the bouncer, and that's it. Yeah, and uh, then we, we. Oh no, he. Um, I'm just kidding. I, don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you had some gossip there. Actually, while we're talking about the band members, can we briefly talk about? How creepy it is that one of them just dresses as a doctor <laughs> and always wears sunglasses. Why not? See, that wasn't. <laughs> He's a cool doctor. <laughs> that was that. That actually didn't catch my attention. The, uh, there's another guy in the band who's like the kind of dweeby-looking white version of Prince. He caught my attention. Yeah, I love that. He dresses exact. He's definitely wearing Prince's clothes yeah. the whole time. <laughs> it would have been. It would have been such a funny scene when Prince is like, "What about you? What do you think?" And then he turns and he goes, what do I think? What do you think? I'm you. We think the same thoughts, you and I. And just like kneels down. And just like they just mirror each other. And that's the scene. And then it could be Lynchian again. They could be the same person. Uh, Oh, I would love that. (gasps) But they split into two beings. (laughs) I don't know, man. That's a a bit too close to the the password is what? Yeah, what? Yeah. Wait, what? what, What's the password? Exactly. Right. The I just is say, that, that, that is great. the worst dialogue in film history. <laughs> no, I, I love like that. This How do we have the opposite opinions? <laughs> <laughs> it went on for about 10 minutes. It stopped being it funny they after 20 have seconds. It back a second time. <laughs> That's the thing I was imagining now, the next episode of Wolfgang, is just going to be people sitting in the apartment going, oh, I need a password for the, for the flat. <laughs> <laughs> the no. password should Sorry. be what? I'll just take the dialogue directly from <laughs> If that happens, that's the only thing that would make me be out on that. It would also <laughs> immediately be the longest episode of Wolfgang, because they're all three to five minutes, and that dialogue, that scene alone was about seven minutes long. You can squeeze Minimum. multiple episodes out of it. That's yep. true. Make the whole month. I think that's the, that's the whole month is just that scene. Yeah. And people are just like, oh, maybe this, maybe something happens this next episode. No, they're still going on about the password. <laughs> it's a Dragon Ball Z situation. Like, oh, they're still just having the same bit. Is, all right. All right, okay. <laughs> Can I bring up as well, there's a, there's a bit, Apollonia here goes back to to Prince's house, well, his, his parents' house, and he's playing uh, some music, and I found it very creepy and serial killery. Very. He's playing her the, the sound of someone crying in reverse. Yeah, this, this was a very Lynchian moment to me. This is like... Very, it was like the Black Lodge. So weird. And then on top of that, he says, it's, it makes me sad. It sounds like she's laughing, doesn't it? No, it doesn't. It still no. sounds like the moans of the damned. Mm. But now I also know that it's a reversed play. It's a reversed recording of a woman crying. That's insane. Yeah, what, what made her cry? I get the impression Prince made her cry and recorded mm. it. Well, Apollonia Ooh. certainly thinks that he did. Mm. Oh, which, yeah. is, which then makes it real weird that they get it on immediately afterwards. Like, that is not setting the mood for sexy mm. times. It's dark as hell. That's the, imagine trying to woo someone and going, do you like this? Do you like this? It's a woman mm. crying. <laughs> so, oh, great. Yeah, I, I would be insanely freaked out. Cause actually, wait, and right, then you I, steal her jewelry. <laughs> yeah. But like, uh, when I actually uh, rewatched this, like, uh, you know, a couple of days back, earlier that day, I'd been reading like a list on, I think it was like Jezebel or something of like, people sending in their true stories of like the creepiest thing that ever happened to you and the one of the big ones was a guy um went out on like a like a grinder date and he went in and this guy was like 
invited him. He took him out of this house. Like, he kept saying, oh, I live around the corner. And then he just, like, drove him 35 minutes out to this place. And the guy was like, I'm pretty sure this is, like, a model home. And then every time, they're kind of dicking around upstairs. And then the guy kept going down to the basement. And you could hear him doing stuff. And every time he shot down, like, oh, what are you doing? The guy would just stop, silent, and then start again. And then eventually, yeah. like, he just ended up, uh, and he's just saying that the place was, like, it felt like, you know, like Dexter's house, basically. And eventually the guy just ran away. Like after, weird enough, he actually. I mean, it he, took him long enough. Weird enough, he did sleep with him as well. <laughs> he's saying even after all his suspicions, he was like, "Oh How no, did we, we get that." Oh yeah, I mean, if you're, you're all the way out. Driven ten minutes to a place around the corner, you leap out the car, text and roll, get out of there. It's better to die on your way out of the car than be kept captive and tortured over a long period. I'm just saying. But yeah, but that struck me like later that day watching this and been like, if you knew Prince, this guy, like, he just looks like he's like a, like a French prince and he's just got this, he just looks like he's oozing money. And then he took you, he went out in this, you know, romantic, in quotes, <laughs> the lake, the, the not Lake Minnetonka. And then he drove you to like, I was like, oh, I'll take you back to my place. And then it was like his parents' house and it was a really seedy little home. <laughs> and then you, you find out he lived in the basement. And then he's playing you the backwards sound of a woman crying. I would be like... While you're surrounded by cement block walls with eyes painted on them. Yes! <laughs> everything. I, yeah. I get, and then you find out, like, oh, he sits and talks to his little ventriloquist puppet. And it'd be like, Did Apollonia run! For the love of Christ, go! I have, the, I have no trust whatsoever with people and like I've got friends that are just like you have to put yourself out there if you want to like date and stuff and I can't and if someone's just like you want to go out for a drink my like immediate response is like why (laughs) suspicious I wouldn't even get to like that bedroom of like masks where I'd be like nope sorry no 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 I like that phrase I don't trust people that's why we're friends (laughs) (laughs) it certainly isn't over taste in films that we we can be assured of that I'm assuming (laughs) And the, to be honest, there's a bit that makes me worry even more. We, just before that, actually, where um, Apollonia... I can't remember the context, actually. She says to to the kid, if you wanted to scare me, you didn't. And he goes, yeah. oh, yeah? <laughs> like, as if, he, as if he doesn't believe her, and his goal was to scare her. Like, Why are you trying to scare a woman? And like, then what? he proceeds to wiggle his hand for two minutes. <laughs> as you do, you know. <laughs> That's scary, because, like, what are you wiggling? Yeah, that's true. (laughs) And that's the end of part one. In a bat minute first, this is actually part one of a two-part episode. We all had so, so much more to say about this film that uh, we actually had to split the episodes up because otherwise it would be insanely long much longer than what you you know what you're usually used to with us so uh part two will actually be airing the same day next week but seeing as batman it is known for its cliffhanger endings now that we have a genuine two-parter with a genuine cliffhanger of sorts i would be remiss if we didn't put a cliffhanger in so Next time, the reign of pain continues. Will our violet fop turn out to be just like his violent pop? Will a song about a periwinkle sprinkle win back the hearts of the people? And can this film take more battery from the queen of the monarch's factory? If part one has been your najam, then find out next week. Same bat pod... Different Bat Minute.